introduce uh, Professor Mark Swelling. He's about to come here, so we use the time <laughs> effectively. Um, but before I do that, um, I'd like to mention that we actually have um, very interesting speakers for the next few weeks. So we've got uh, Professor Devon Pele, who will be talking around uh, questions relating to um, as broadly, eco-socialism, as will the following speaker, Vishva Satka. Um, and then followed, following that will be Michaela Marcotelli, who's a postdoc in this department. So we've got an interesting uh, series of, of speakers who talk into environmental politics. And we're really pleased to have um, Professor Mark Swilling today. He's the Program Director of the Sustainability Development uh, pro uh, Program at the School of Public Leadership, Academic Director of the Sustainability Institute, Co-Director of the Center for Complex Systems in Transition. And his key areas that he's been interested in are societal trans transitions, sustainability, science and governance, as well as questions of urban sustainability. And his work I mean, goes back to um, a very interesting urban activist organization called Plan Act. In, I think you were a founder member of, of that. And a long series of collaborations with Professor Edgar Peterson at the African City Center at the University of Cape Town. He was awarded the Aspen Faculty Pioneer Award in 2010 and has published over 60 books, articles, chapters, etc. And the recent books are a book together with Eve Annika called Just Transitions, Explorations in Sustainability in an Unfair World in 2012, and then Untamed Urbanisms 2015, Greening the South African Economy in 2016, and a book is currently being written. I read um, the kind of introduction, it really fascinated. And uh, the story in that introduction, one of the stories is uh, Mark's own involvement at the Sustainability Institute with very interesting experimentations in informal settlement housing. So the ISHAC program, which you've probably heard about, um, is extremely interesting. It, it deals with this two key concepts, and I'm not, not going to go into it, and perhaps you will be talking to it, is this idea of radical incrementalism, which, which Eka Peterson and Mark have, have used before, which is neither revolution nor reform as we know it. So it's, uh, it's a hybrid concept. And then also the idea of the boundary object, which is a term that Bruno Latour uses and we had a very interesting discussion here at 11 with Mark and John van Breda from the Sustainability Institute around the question of the ISHAC as a boundary object, an object that creates a lot of engagement as a material object and an object that brings together diverse views, opens up conversations about different ways of thinking about the future, etc. So what, what we'll have is the usual format of 40 to 50 minutes and then discussion. Mark, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Stephen, and uh, greetings to all of you and some familiar faces and some new ones. Um, uh, when Lloyd asked me or invited me to come and talk, uh, he suggested I talk about this new book uh, that I've just completed and will be published in September. And I agreed to do that, uh, but then I realized I have absolutely no idea how to do this uh, when I started thinking about this talk last night. Um, and. And that's got a lot to do with the fact that it's a, it's a kind of work of synthesis across many different parts of my work over the last 20 years, from very, very local struggles to global transitions, spanning uh, economic systems, sustainability, uh, urban systems, 
And I, I was given a, a fellowship uh, to um, be a, a, re a residency at Yale uh, last year. I spent eight years, eight months there. And um, I, I, I started this residency in March last year. And my question to myself was, does my work make any sense? <laughs> or, is it just, <laughs> or is it just a collection of, of highly distracted and disconnected uh, ideas uh, and initiatives and projects? Because I tend to write about what I get involved in rather than um, uh, kind of derive uh, my research work from theoretical explorations. I, I, I tend, I, I'm, a, I'm a fastidious adherent to a theory of strategy that Henry Mintzberg made famous, which is strategy is about giving meaning to what's already emerging. So that's really what I, what I, I suppose, hopefully, I will try and do uh, in, in this book. It's, in a sense, my reading of what I think I've done. So I'll just go through uh, the framework and then home in on one or two uh, elements um, of, of the narrative. Um, in, in the, the, the points of departure uh, uh, for, for the book, the original title for the book was uh, Reflections of an Enraged Incrementalist. <laughs> and the, and the, the publisher <laughs> said, I, you know, we have no idea what this means. And <laughs> nobody will take a book off a shelf with that title. Um, uh, but really, the, 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 the introduction is, is, is really about that. It's a reflection on, of my own journey. Uh, and it's, it's, it's an engagement with ways of thinking about change in, in the highly complex world we currently live in. And I'm, I'm interested in, in incrementalism um, uh, because I'm, I, I really do believe the most radical person in the room is usually the person who asks the question, what do we do next? And it's not necessarily the person who talks first or makes any grand claims about understanding the fundamental contradictions of capitalism. Um, and, and, and I think it's why that's important for me is that I want to uh, connect that form of power to a resuscitation of the value of rage. Uh, and the kind of taming of rage is what I kind of rage against in the, in, in, in the, intro, in, in the introduction. And in the second part of the, uh, of, of, of the, the second chapter in part one, uh, really is an, is, is, a, is an exploration of a multiplicity of meta-theoretical frameworks that in one way or another shed light on a relational conception of the self which has emerged out of post-humanism, but also uh, the relational conception of the self that is embedded in a large body of writing in sub-Saharan Africa amongst African writers, which is sub sometimes referred to as ukama, uh, the, the Shona word for relatedness, not just to each other, but also to nature, uh, and nature not just as animate, but also inanimate objects, but also to the ancestors as the linkage between past, present, and future. So, so a kind of Ukamian, if you like, sense or interpretation of the three kind of dominant uh, or emerging, uh, not dominant, emerging meta-theoretical frameworks since the turn of the millennium. Uh, Roy Bashkar's critical realism, which all of these originate in the 80s, but become increasingly uh, influential, especially after the turn of the century. Roy Bashkar's Critical Realism, Edgar Moran's uh, Complexity uh, Theory, and Ken Wilber's Integral Theory. And basically, I'll, I'll, I'll run through what I, what, what, uh, I think is the, is the synthesis that's emerging from these meta-theoretical frameworks. Uh, but I use them rather than um, uh, arrive at them. I use them as the basis for what I'm really interested in as the entry point for this book, which is uh, to establish a conceptual framework for a non-equilibrium economics, uh, which is really a critique of the kind of general equilibrium economic theory that underpins the economic models that drive most of the policy frameworks uh, in the countries of the world, including our own. 
and and on the basis of that, uh, to uh, think about new conceptions of governance. And I arrive at this, I, Bob Jessop's, uh, an elaboration of Bob Jessop's idea of calibratory governance, the idea that um, uh, the decentering of, of po politics since the 70s has arrived, we've arrived at this re relational conception of governance, but it, has, it, is, it is problematic when it comes to directionality. So if you want complexity, uh, you end up with governance, uh, but when you want to, you, you will find it difficult to deal with directionality. And if, if you don't have directionality in a world faced with a poly crisis, uh, we don't have a way out of our mess. Uh, so I try and explore this idea, which is really the notion of the governance of governance. What a new generation of meta governance institutions that are emerging to facilitate governance relations. And I couple that, too, with the new literature on commons-based peer-to-peer production, a kind of alternative to state and market-based conceptions of the economy. So that's, that, this, this is, a, I suppose, for me, a um, relational meta-theoretical frameworks provide the basis for a new radical uh, political project and the three elements of that, in my view, if we, if, 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 to, to kind of rebuild a radical polity, the underlying uh, theoretical synthesis would need to be non-equilibrium economics, sometimes called complexity economics, but I prefer non-equilibrium non economics, calibrated governance, and the commons-based peer-to-peer production. Some of you might be more familiar with that commons literature out of the Ostrom literature, which is more the conservative end of that literature and focused on natural resources. Uh, the new, more radical commons literature is, about, is, is essentially about money. So part two, and I'll, I'll say more about uh, in a bit more detail uh, chapter four, but just summary in, in part two. Chapter three uh, is, is, it brings together in, a, in a, the kind of first synthesis of the work of the International Resource Panel. So I've been a member of the International Resource Panel since 2007. It was set up in the wake of the IPCC report, the fourth assessment report, which got the Nobel Prize. And the conclusion of that, of the fourth assessment report was the global economy needs to be restructured if we want to decarbonize. Uh, but that's not we, what we climate scientists know how to do. So. Uh, UNEP set up the International Resource Panel uh, to look at how we restructure the global economy from the perspective of how we change the way we use resources. Uh, so in that panel over many years we've looked at all the major resources, forests, water, all the different, all, all the different uh, metals, oceans, you know, whatever. So it's everything except carbon. Uh, um, in order to understand how, what are the mechanisms, what are the infrastructures and processes that will need to change. In chapter four, I, 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 I synthesize the literature on long way of thinking in order to understand our current moment with, with a desire to, to, to move beyond, to, to, to kind of think about the future in a way which modelers don't do. Uh, and modeling is what dominates uh, the way we, th we, 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 we try and understand the future. And it's very ahistorical, our modeling. Uh, and so this long wave theory, I think, helps to kind of rectify the balance by bringing in historical <coughs> trends. Uh, uh, but instead of looking for a single long wave, which is what most people do, I look for asynchronic uh, long waves. And I'll say more about that now. In chapter five, I'm interested in a theory of change, which we can call radical incrementalism. And that's really uh, 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 trying to kind of force two sides of me which have historically caused serious schizophrenic kind of heebie-jeebies. And, and that is, uh, being somebody who lived through the transition, I've sat for so many hours in rooms with a whole bunch of clever people in front of flip charts and a facilitator, and we're constructing visions of the future. Uh, called scenarios or narratives or stories, and we kind of reverse engineer those into the present, and you know, that's how we kind of muddled our way through the transition. But 
futurists in general are extremely uh, impatient with the present. Um, they kind of regard the present as a kind of burning platform between the past and the future, and you have to get off it as quickly as possible. So think in future terms. And the experimenters are completely different. Uh, experimenters love the present. Uh, there's a kind of deliciousness about the present and its complexities. Uh, and so the muddling is like, well, let's make things work. Uh, and they're impatient with the chattering classes who think about, talk about the future all the time but don't do anything. And so I try to bring these, these two together, um, realizing that actually the, the, the frameworks of the two are very different, the literatures, the histories. Um, and they come together uh, around this new uh, uh, work on anticipatory thinking um, as a kind of third wave in futuring. Uh, futuring is originated in forecasting, modeling, quantitative, predictive, uh, shifted into foresighting, which is narrative, stories, qualitative, uh, and um, in anticipatory thinking is much more interested in the present. So the evolutionary potential of the present is what uh, anticipatory thinkers are, are interested in. And that works for me. Uh, the evolutionary potential of the present, a phrase that comes from the work of Dave Snowden, and connects um, with Roberto Unger's conception of in incrementalism. So for Roberto Unger, his, his obsession with uh, uh, his critique of structure fetishism is based on an impatience with the notion that the only valid form of, of change is structural change from one structural configuration to another, whether it's from feudalism to capitalism, capitalism, social, whatever. Uh, and and as, as uh, he argues, this, this, this denies the, the, the liberating power of the incrementalist who is figuring out, mixing and matching and making stuff happen. Uh, as, as, as a way that leads to, can lead to fundamental change. And I, I really just operationalized that idea through an exploration of the uh, 27 case studies from the global south of, of ecocultures. And in part three, um, I, I shift my attention to the state um, and, and the whole question of transitions. And in chapter seven, I try to bring together the literature on developmental states and sustainability transitions with reference to the South African uh, renewable energy transition. And, and as you know, the literature on developmental states has been obsessed with structural transformation, especially with respect to the transition from agricultural to industrial societies and accelerated industrialization. And at the center of that is a very particular conception of the state. Um, as, as relatively embedded, relatively autonomous, not captured, uh, uh, but with sufficient capacity for facilitating directionality. The sustainability transitions literature, which comes out of Europe, especially the Netherlands, <coughs> um, is also interested in structural transformation, uh, but is primarily interested in the transitions to more sustainable forms of production and consumption, and has traditionally not taken politics very seriously, assumed uh, a, 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 a kind of mature state system, um, and uh, has not, there's not a significant literature on the Global South uh, in the sustainability transition field, but that's rapidly changing. So in light of the Sustainable Development Goals, which talks in the preamble about a transformed world, these two have to come together, uh, because in those sustainable goals for all their weaknesses, there is a commitment to eradicating poverty without blowing the fuses of the planet. Uh, and, and the state is going to have to play a key role. So can, is there stuff that we can, if it is, what can we learn from the developmental state literature that we can feed and, 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 and dovetail into the sustainability transition literature that may be helpful for countries like ours? And um, uh, you know, that's become particularly relevant in the last couple of months with the meltdown of uh, ESCOM. Uh, and really the only way out of that is climate funding to accelerate the closure of coal uh, and the transition to renewables, easy to say. 
probably won't happen, but we might just have an IMF bailout which will force us to face reality at some point. Um, so chapter 8 um, is, 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 it takes this idea of sustainability transitions and the role of the state into an understanding of the global renewable energy revolution. And it, it really is, it, it amazes me how little, how, how little, how, how unaware we are of the significance of the, of the global energy revolution. And more importantly, there's almost, there's very little understanding of the origins of the uh, renewable energy revolution in Denmark and, and Germany. So what I do in this, uh, in this uh, chapter is really look at the economics and finance of the renewable energy revolution. The point of entry really is that investments in renewables now is roughly $300 billion. Uh, the, uh, so we'll probably hit that this year. Um, it was 280 something uh, last year. And um, uh, that's double total investments in fossil fuels and, 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 and nuclear combined. Um, so uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at the, uh, when you look at the, the nature of these investments, uh, the pattern is extremely interesting, which is contrary to the traditional economic theory, which is the state invests in R&D and then the private sector uh, takes the market. There's a steady accelerated increase in public sector investments in renewables, which then sucks in private sector investments over a long period of time uh, so that private sector investments overtakes. And I'll say a bit more about that at the end if there's time. But what's interesting in this story for me is the fact that most of the accounts of the renewable energy revolution ignore the fact that the origins of the, of the renewable energy technologies that we now depend on, manufactured largely in China, um, uh, originated in, cooperate, in the cooperative movement in Denmark and Germany. And the logic of this is fairly simple. Uh, a whole bunch of anti-nuclear hippies uh, uh, in the 1980s think, okay, we better kind of demonstrate there's an alternative. And they go start fiddling about, this is my love of the incrementalist, uh, uh, with setting up cooperatives and, and, and playing around with technologies. And, they, and in Denmark, they, 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 they do windmills, and in Germany, they do uh, uh, solar energy. By the year 2000, 80% of all windmills in Denmark are owned by our cooperatives. By the year 2012, 50% of all solar in Germany is owned by cooperatives. And the interesting uh, learning, uh, learning curves, but also re learning relationships between companies and the cooperatives in a pretty much an open source type environment is what really fascinates me. Because if we take seriously the IPCC report that says we have a 12 year window to kind of turn, the, turn this uh, juggernaut around, we need very, very rapid learning. Where's the precedent for rapid, rapid learning? And what is the institutional and organizational and technological environments or precedents where this has happened? Germany in the 80s, 90s, and in the early 2000s, and, and Denmark up until 2000, are really, really important case studies. Um, what we have in South Africa as renewables is the, is the corporate takeover, the implementation of the corporate takeover of renewables that happened in Denmark and Germany after those two turning points, 2000, 2012. Uh, so, so, so why I'm interested in that is that it really is about a kind of proto-commons environment of knowledge construction, learning, social organization that is uh, neither status or market, a pure market in, in the individualistic sense. Uh, it's an alternative form of social organization that seems to be coterminous with the materiality of renewables uh, in some way. And I'm just very interested in that. Um, and, and, and what that says, if we are interested in a new movement that's emerging around the world, which is called energy, democ energy democracy. Uh, 
the democratization of renewables through more public and social ownership rather than the corporate model that we have inside. And then finally, um, uh, in chapter nine, I, uh, I, I look at the, the fight back, <coughs> to use a South African term. Um, and, and this is really about the rise of authoritarian populism around, around the world and in South Africa. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the connection between uh, uh, the, uh, the, the way in which the, the, the resistance to transition in the form of authoritarian populism mobilizes, mobilizes toxic masculinity. And in the South African, what I do, this is mainly, this is the only chapter that is mainly about South Africa. What I do is I revisit the work I've done over the last two or three years on state capture. Uh, and in South Africa, the political economy of state capture is one body of literature that says virtually nothing about gender and patriarchy and misogyny. And there's a whole different literature on gender, uh, patriarchy and misogyny uh, in the post-94 period and what happens to that during the Zuma years. But these haven't been brought together um, uh, in an adequate way. So this is what I try and do in this chapter as a case study of why authoritarianism appeals to talk and appeals to and mobilizes toxic masculinity in very specific ways. And I end up using this term, which is a, is a slight manipulation of Doug. Daggett, is it Daggett, Karen Daggett, who knows this? Nobody. Um, uh, she's written about uh, petro-masculinity uh, and, and climate change and the resistance and climate denialism and petro-masculinity and uh, in the US context. But in, I've kind of slightly adapted that to the South African context, integrated with Fanon's thinking and said we need to um, we need to think about this as electro-masculinity because the nuclear story is part of that, not just fossil fuels. Uh, and then, yeah, the last part is really just uh, what does this mean for teaching and a reflection on, on my work over the last two decades at the Sustainability Institute. Um, so that's the overview uh, of, the, of, of, of the narrative. What I thought might be useful is briefly to dip into uh, long way of thinking, uh, and uh, to choose, uh, and I hope you agree. I don't have to, I could do something else. Um, um, but before I do that, uh, for me, the, the integration of the meta theoretical frameworks, uh, drawing on, on, on these writers going back to the 80s, but becoming very influential at the turn of the century. Uh, these are the, uh, if, like the key terms uh, that I think are significant. So this should be a bullet point in front of the first one. Uh, integrative non-reductionist, that's fairly uh, uh, well known. Post-formal um, cognition, how we understand uh, the complexity of the subject. A realist ontology, in other words, rebalancing epistemology and ontology rather than the dominance of epistemology. Um, a stratified vision of reality. There are different principles operating at different levels, and you can't reduce one to the other. Quantum at one level, non-quantum at other levels. Therefore, inter- and transdisciplinary ways of doing research. And resulting... Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. That's... Be one point, unitas, um, unitas uh, complexity, understanding the reality and the ways we understand that reality uh, in, in, uh, through the lens of complexity, a space for spirituality and an ethics of emancipation, or axiology. Homo complexus, complexus the uh, relational self, and uh, finally, contextual specificity. Um, those for me are kind of key building blocks of a kind of relational, of the kind of relational meta theory that underpins all this, the, the rest of the book. So let me go through uh, 
what I think is an important way of historicizing an understanding of the conjuncture and, and, and the dynamics of transition, which breaks from the traditional search in long way thinking for the way that explains the past and the future. And I break from that and say we need to think in terms of a multiplicity of waves, which is in some ways pretty obvious, uh, but it's not how the literature works. Um, so for the work of very, very, very influential work of Marina Fischer Kowalski from the Institute for Social Ecology in Vienna, and really her work is the conceptual and empirical foundation for the work of the International Resource Panel. She's an extremely influential member of the panel, hardly ever says a word, um, uh, and it's just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a literature that really transformed my understanding of the world. And basically, in very, very simplistic terms, uh, she, uh, she reinterprets history uh, in terms of a series of metabolic, socio-metabolic cycles. So just as we are metabolisms, we eat stuff, we process stuff, we release stuff, societies and economies are the same. Uh, and in historic terms, up until the, the last ice age, we were hunter-gatherers and our resources were temporary spaces to meet uh, wild food and fire for the last 300,000 <coughs> years. The agricultural revolution where we shift to using soils, land, building materials, water and biomass, and she computes this and quantifies it in elaborate detail. Um, and then the transition to uh, the industrial era, fossil fuels, minerals, uh, and metals, 8.7 billion hectares of land. We expect, well, now it's gone up to 120 billion tons of stuff and plus pollution. Uh, so, I mean, it's, a, it's basically a picture in a series of long, long waves uh, of these uh, metabolic cycles. And like all long wave thinking, the assumption is if we've had transitions before, they can happen again. Uh, and this is obviously the wishful thinking component. Uh, we should less fossil fuels, less pollution, less materials, a lot more renewable energy. Obviously what's absent from these, many of these kinds of long wave thinking frameworks that emerge out of sustainability science is the, the question of a just transition of equality and distribution. It's not there. Um, so, another set of cycles are the economic cycles or conjunctive cycles, um, which are really economic uh, cycles, uh, with two key variables, growth and prices. Um, and so, the, the long wave cycle from the end of the 19th century uh, that defines the beginning of the 20th century with the 1929 crash with an interregnum that gets pretty much only resolved in quotes with the Pearl Harbor and the entry of the US into the Second World War, which triggers the post-Second World War long wave. Uh, the year 2009 being a key turning point, uh, because 2009 was the first and only year after the Second World War that the global economy shrank. And many of the people who use uh, contractive thinking uh, basically point to um, the 2007-2008 two, two thousand and seven, eight, two thousand and nine, uh, in particular, as the end of the post Second World War long term development cycle. It's the other phrase that is used uh, by Charles Gore, uh, who was a senior economist at UNCTAD up until a few years ago, who really uh, did a lot of this work. So again, uh, like with metabolic cycles, if there have been conjunctive cycles before, they can happen again. What is that? What are the dynamics of that? What's, what, what from a, you know, in terms of, from the perspective of the evolutionary potential of the present, what are the glimpses, what are the dynamics of the moment that are hints uh, of uh, another cycle? And all conjunctive cycles begin with upticks in investments in communications, energy, and mobility. New, new communications, new mobility, new, this is our infrastructure discussion, new communication infrastructures, new mobility infrastructures, new energy infrastructures. But I won't go through the details of contractive cycles. Um, 
uh, the third set of, of, long, of long wave cycles are uh, Carlotta Perez's work, a Venezuelan economist based in Europe who comes out of the science technology studies kind of environment and uh, uh, historicizes the traditional S-curve in science and technology studies um, and identifies, and this is very influential work, uh, now it's penetrated into uh, the sustainability world in a very big way. She identifies basically five major techno-industrial cycles uh, during the industrial era. And although she started her work trying to correlate uh, uh, the clustering of technologies and te te technology cycles with economic growth cycles, she gave up because they are not coterminous. Uh, they run on different, uh, different 40 to 50 year cycles. Um, and so I'm trying to represent them here as, in, as uh, asynchronic. And as you can see, uh, I'm not going to run through these. They're probably f familiar to, you can imagine, most of those transitions and the, and the, and the technology clusters associated with, with each one of them. So what I'm, <coughs> so whereas many different writers try and uh, uh, synthesize and find, find single long wave and sometimes just maybe correlating two of them like Charles Gore who correlates Perez and, and, and conjunctive cycles but ignores metabolic cycles most people ignore, ignore the metabolic cycles I'm interested in the eight synchronic dynamics of these long wave uh, cycles and in particular, and I think that's particularly important for understanding uh, the, the, the current moment. And like all long wave thinking, the conclusion is obvious. If there's been uh, techno-industrial cycles before, there'll be another one. Uh, for Perez, she's not convinced that this is happening. As far as Perez is concerned, the, the second phase of the uh, ICT revolution is the, is the next story. And let me just show you why she argues that. So these are her cycles um, um, and where, where they originated and the, the time frame. She demonstrates that in a classic pattern in all of them is uh, inventions which become innovations when uh, investment capital, uh, financial capital crowds in around. Investment capital have herd mentality so they overinvest. Uh, what is called a major technology bubble, which is a critique of Minsky, if those of you know economics. Um, that results in a, in, a, in a financial crisis. State intervenes, reorganizes the institutions of society to absorb the new technology. And you go into a deployment period or a golden age <coughs> of maturing of the technologies. Uh, finance capital gets a slap on the wrist. They look for the new innovators. So there's a new cycle emerging here. Uh, and that's the generic uh, structure of these, of these, of these S-curves. And lo and behold, each one of them has an, a crisis uh, in the middle of all of them. And that's where Perez stops. So she's, she says that we're going, the script will be followed. Uh, there will be a consolidation. And, a, and there will be some greening because the planet is falling to pieces on the edges. Yes, yes, yes. But there is no significant uh, evidence of a sixth uh, techno-industrial surge, which I disagree with. And so that's really uh, how I understand our world. So I put these, these together. Um, and uh, in the end, for me, uh, when, we when we start having discussions about trying to understand the complexity and specificity of, uh, and also regional differentiation of the current moment and what is this transition to sustainability. We need to look for the, the, the asynchronic dynamics of these different long waves. There's a new literature, just a year or two old, that is talking about a deep transition. So Johann Scott, for example, one of the founders of the Sustainability Transitions Literature in the Netherlands, is writing about the first deep transition and the second uh, uh, deep uh, transition. But my question is, under what conditions can, would this be 
a just transition. Where, uh, and my profound worry that tunnels its way through the whole book is a decarbonized, unequal world is a distinct possibility. Um, and that would be an unjust transition. So, what is this? Uh, and, and that's really what I worry about, and I mobilize these different tools. Uh, not to arrive at some teleological uh, uh, set of predictions, or even forecasts, or storylines, or narratives, but for, for uh, and arrows are always problematic, okay? mm -hmm. uh, uh, for just saying that if, uh, and what I do specific work on is what are the investment dynamics in renewables, mobility, and communication infrastructures, and how are these connecting? Uh, what is the maturation of the deployment phase of the ICT era looking like? The mergers and acquisitions, the construction of the ICT behemoths, and their integration of value chains. And how does that interact uh, with the shift of finance into green tech, and in particular renewables, as we've seen in the renewable energy revolution? So that's that's how I deploy these, not to kind of construct a kind of false hope that it's all kind of heading in the right direction. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe I would. I mean, the the urban question for me is obviously significant, uh, coming out of coming at this through the urban trajectory that. All of this uh, kind of conflagration of, of dynamics uh, is happening at a time when we are more majority urban. And many, and I track a lot of the urban transitions around the world, um, at, the, at, the, at the urban city level, there's an agglomeration of wealth, knowledge, institutional capacity, innovation, which is, which is, which is mobilizing a lot of these dynamics in, in contextually specific ways, and I, I'm, uh, that's, a, that's a part of the story of the chapter on uh, incrementalism and futurism. What I haven't referred to is the transitions literature itself. The transitions literature makes this distinction between landscapes, and regimes, and niches, and the interactions, but the focus of their work, unlike the, the three long waves that I have, I've, I've looked at, is sectoral. So it's difficult to map this onto that, onto, onto that framework. But nevertheless, there's a grain of truth uh, in the way in which these dynamics uh, pan out, especially if you are, if, if you are, if, if, if you are interested in the future of socio-technical regimes like energy. So the, 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 what's hap the, when the C, outgoing CEO of ESCOM last week said that ESCOM is in a death spiral, not only was that terribly frightening, but this is what I thought of. Is, is, these are the dynamics uh, uh, at, at play. So I think I want to uh, uh, leave it at that and say, yes, there is a backlash, and we recognize all of these dynamics in the world today, including in our own society. It's got a lot to do with this, this conflation of toxic masculinity and authoritarian populism, and it takes many different forms and do across different societies, but the underlying dynamics are very, uh, are, are, are very similar. Uh, so I think, let me leave it at that, uh, rather than going into the renewable energy transition discussion. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> we have an enormous amount to think about. What we will we'll do normally is take three or four questions is, is that okay? Yeah, want to more than that. Yeah. At one time, and then you respond. Comments, questions? Oh, and before I forget, um, there's a film screening at, I think it's 3, 3 p.m. And you strike a rock for Women's Day. So that's at, yeah, 3 p.m. in this room. In this room. Okay. It's a documentary on the Women's Act And please introduce yourself to me. <coughs> yeah. um, I'm John Cheryl Walker from the Department. So you've given us an enormous amount uh, to think about and engage with, and really looking forward to the book. So, so thank you. And I have two questions today. <coughs> I mean, one, one is around um, 
uneven processes of these propositions, which you obviously hinted at um, in terms of some of what's happening, say, in the North, and particularly maybe Western Europe, um, and what's happening here, but not only in and you know, how those very different uh, complex processes, how you're thinking about that, trying to not map them on, but how they are, um, how they might work out, because it, it, they very, it seems to me there's quite different sets of parts happening, which are obviously connected globally in all sorts of ways, but um, are also moving in. in quite unpredictable ways perhaps, including just simply in terms of the sheer output of carbon from a society like our own. So, so that's the one issue, I suppose. And then the other is just the, the idea of the toxic masculinity and authoritarian populism. I mean, I'm sympathetic to the idea of toxic, <coughs> toxic masculinity is, is, a, is a force to be engaged, contended with, and resisted, but how, not really clear how you're working it into your sort of understanding of what's going on and it seems to me it needs a lot there's a lot else needed that one needs to sort of bring into that analysis. Mm. For sure. John you wait for um, any more comments or questions or Shahid and could you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Shahid I'm also a lecturer here in anthropology. Um, I thought it was very fascinating I mean, generally from the state of the I'm just wondering two questions. One is about incrementalism versus the box. <coughs> on the one hand, you, and I was following you about, you know, anti-epochal kind of theories, and, you know, but then it seems like later on your entire argument is based on identification of eras and epochs. Um, so how do these things actually fit in? And just to link to Cheryl, is it not, you know, the toxic masculinity might be a bit limited, but we need to think about a kind of heroic impulse to kind of constantly categorize and define the moment, and whether the whole sustainability thing and this, you know, this idea of the fourth industrial revolution, like there seems to be an impulse today to, 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 to tell us where we are right now in the middle of the thing, right? But as far as I understand, that's impossible. We only know about massive transformations in thought and technology after the and so now we can look at the Industrial Revolution and understand you know, what it meant, both in philosophy and in uh, ecology nowadays. So, yeah, I guess that's just the question. Like, how do you relate this question of masculinity to the kind of what we know about enlightenment theory and the way it links to the desire to constantly know and categorize to a theory what is actually a very capitalist enterprise theory, like carbon credits and all those things. I mean, is it really heavy? I mean, Maybe you can tell us more. Like, what are the kinds of outputs that are taking place? You know, Germany claims all the time that they got no carbon credits, that they, that they, that they decreased. You know, for example, this. But I've got friends who are in science, who are scientists in Germany, and they say no, they're just buying electricity from France. <laughs> right? So it's not actually a massive transformation. So many people are skeptical about, you know, uh, yeah, about the link between actual outputs and. <coughs> Is there another question or comment? Or? Yes. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm from this department. Um, I'd like to just um, ask if you thought about the role of religion um, in terms of in relation to your topic of masculinity, because uh, Ilana Kinbey wrote an interesting piece around God and Jacob Zuma, and the painful cost of the movement. Uh, the public protector drew on being appointed by God the other day, and mm -hmm. Trump is also quite. Quite orientated. So, <laughs> 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 wants to know yeah, what your thoughts are of religion in relation to toxic masculinity. Okay, I think unless there's a press and a question, why don't you respond? Yeah. Mm. I suppose the. Uh, some of the reviews of the book described me as reckless. <laughs> um, um, I, I actually, I found that 
complimentary, actually. I, mean, I, 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 I think it really is time uh, for us to take risks and kind of be a bit reckless, not irresponsible, but reckless, and, and just connecting thoughts and churning up stuff and saying, I, can't, I don't know the answers to all of this, uh, but dig here, I, you know. So in that spirit, um, um, <coughs> for me, the link between, uh, the, 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 for me, I don't think in terms of epochs. Uh, for me, the, the long way of thinking is, is really about the linkages. So it's about tr the transitional dynamics between so-called epochs. And um, as Roberto Unger argues, none of those existed in pure form. Not those so-called, even in socio-metabolic terms, they weren't, there's no such thing as a pure industrial regime. Or the agricultural one still survives. Even the hunter-gatherer one still survives. So those arrows that, you know, all it just, in practice, uh, empirically, those neat categorizations don't exist. Uh, um, but, they, but I think it's still legitimate. So what I'm primarily interested in is kind of dominant dynamics at particular historical moments uh, as we transition uh, from uh, one kind of Overall, in historical terms, yes, uh, one overarching set of social arrangements to another. Um, my <coughs> impatience with long wave theory is that they just talk, they just use in very simplistic terms the notion of transition to refer to very complex processes. So what are those complex processes underneath? If you lift the bonnet on that, what's, what's, what are the mechanics? What are the dynamics? What are the complexities? Uh, and so it, it depends on your lens. So as you, if at a broad level, you can use concepts like transition, but if you want to know how they work and you, you go to greater levels of detail, uh, you need terms like incrementalism uh, to reveal the complexities that are very context uh, uh, specific. So for me, that, uh, that's the regional variation is, is, is fundamentally important and we see it so clearly uh, in the world today. I mean, uh, uh, Trump is really about um, uh, trying to rescue coal, um, and he's failing. Um, and uh, gas is not going to keep the U.S. economy um, ticking over like it is now for much, so much longer. And uh, the energy return on energy invested for oil is, 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 is dropping like a stone. Um, so, so where do you get cheap oil? I mean, in, in the world today, if you want cheap oil and you can't make money out of coal, you have to steal the oil. And that's another word for war. Uh, so, so, I mean, for, for Putin, uh, he says, yeah, I also support sustainable development. Of course I do. Uh, but that means nuclear. Uh, so we have to get off coal. We have to get off oil. Uh, and so we're going to build a fleet of nuclear power plants. Uh, and hence the civilianization of, of, the, of the Soviet era uh, value chain to kind of build nuclear power plants, not just in Russia, but in Eastern Europe and the rest of the world. And obviously that's right at the center of our politics. So we thought nuclear is dead. It's not. Where did Montage put back on the, back on the table? Um, and the, the, the army of block of, of uh, the bot army that discredits renewables on a continuous daily basis, including the public protector, who has now uh, launched an investigation into the legality of the renewable energy program and served papers to the CEO come chairman of ESCOM just because he hasn't got enough problems to worry about. Um, uh, it just is just part of this. I, I, I've written about it, the connections between these, uh, this, the, 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 the fight back, uh, the, the nuclear, the nu Putin nuclear strategy, uh, and the anti-renewable movement. Um, so big variations, huge variations, and uh, and and I, I've got a research team. We're doing research on the way in which the the Russian shadow state through the oligarchs is moving into this has already established very strong uh, bases in 13 African countries. 
uh, with campaigns, with money, with military, with private intelligence services. And it's, it's really, really worrying. And it's a very different strategy to uh, the, the US strategy. So, so how we in the African context respond uh, becomes really important. So uh, the total re installed generation capacity on the African continent is equal to what exists in France. There's a billion people growing at five, six, seven, eight, nine percent. If Africa energizes using renewables, none of the targets agreed to in Paris on climate will be achieved. That's a factual statement. So the world has an interest in uh, funding a renewable energy energization program in the African context, as do Africans. Uh, what form is that going to take? Can you imagine the industrialization of African economies using renewables? Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what Carlos Lopez, the former General Secretary of, of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, that's what he talks about in his platforms. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, these are all completely different trajectories. The contexts are so different. Uh, um, yeah, I, the toxic masculine, yes, um, you know, uh, uh, for a white male to be talking about toxic masculinity um, uh, is obviously a little worrying, uh, especially for me. Uh, um, and I've, I've given the, I'm, if the, I've never been frightened of anything I've ever written. But this chapter, I'm profoundly frightened of, in many different ways. Uh, um, so, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have a great level of confidence about the uh, richness of the way this argument has built up. But to answer your question, Cheryl, basically what I do um, is... Um, Take as a point of departure the kind of Frankfurt School conception or explanation of authoritarianism, uh, which is, uh, well, I suppose I'm really thinking of the words of Foucault that uh, our support for the strong man and the authoritarian, the external authoritarian, is a reflection of the authoritarian in us all. So that's, that's in a sense, the the, the, the point of departure. And then um, uh, that then gets contextualized by, 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 by Daggett um, in a world of increasing economic insecurity for men who previously were more entitled and the reaction that that, that, that triggers as part of the explanation for the rise of toxic masculinity uh, and, and fight back. And anti, uh, the defense of fossil fuels and climate denialism. The cult you know, comes out of the energy culture literature. Um, and then I ask, okay, what was the equivalent in the South African context? In 1994, Mandela made a promise, jobs. But the subtext was jobs for black men. And that was how it was interpreted and believed. But that was not delivered. Uh, and what was the consequences for masculinity? And, what, and that's what the literature, that whole body of literature of all the South Africans are writing about that. What does that tell us about uh, the, um, you know, like Debbie Puzzle's work on, on, on baby rape, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, 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 I, and in the chapter, I don't just focus on black men, which is what most people do, uh, but what happened to white men? Uh, what happened to uh, um, the transition from the kind of bruder bond, uh, the Africana cultural Calvinist uh, definition of masculinity to the kind of suave, clean-shaven, stay out of the lion light, white CEO uh, that has done so brilliantly uh, in 1994 in financial terms, the only group of people that has really actually significantly improved their wealth. Um, but they will also, instead of just killing themselves, they will 
kill the family first and then kill themselves uh, because they can't bear the thought that the rest of the family can survive without them. Uh, so, so how do we, so I really, I really, really struggle. Uh, I don't, I, I don't have answers to this. I, I'm part of the men, uh, the men's movement. I have uh, every Thursday night, I go and meet with my men's group, made up of men of all colours and all classes, and we all wrestle with exactly the same things. That we have no idea who we are in this society. There isn't a vision for masculinity, and it's left a crisis that gets. Uh, projected outwards in forms of violence uh, which were very, very, very much part of uh, what we've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So when Karl van Holt writes about the construction of a violent democracy after 94, with no reference to these dynamics, for me that's problematic. There must be a connection. So that's what I'm trying to, 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 to work out. You don't seem convinced, but it's not this short. <laughs> well, it's an important one, given that tomorrow is Women's Day and men are the problem, so generally not always. But yes, you've left that slide on. Huh? <laughs> and we're going to take another round. We've got more than enough time, so three to four questions, comments. <coughs> And can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, as Shelly said, this is too much to process, but thank you so much for the contribution. Um, I can't imagine how we understand this, this concept, or how we can understand these transitions without looking at the position of workers, um, where they are located, and in terms of how these processes affect affected the notion of work and how workers um, mobilize and demobilize in terms of pushing back and not being able to push back. And how today we come to think of work as something that is now precarious, that workers find themselves in a much more precarious position and the ability to mobilize, to push back has now been compromised by some of these processes. So would you like to maybe, um, just I want to pick your brain on this in terms of how you think about the notion of work and how it has become present and whether or not there is hope for the working class struggle to be able to push back. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, um, well, that's the same, like, about the question about religions, God, but here I'm thinking, I want to join on to Daniel's uh, question. How do we think about this power transition, particularly, uh, and, and the moment that it's happening under? transition occurred under the Zuma administration and to please reflect on the just transition, trans, or the attempt to transition at least, to stop the transition in relation to this particular moment. But also, in a way that we are thinking of jobs in terms of um, megawatts installed or produced, what, what, what are we doing with work if we are going to start measuring it in, in that way? Um, I mean, I just seem to hear what you said, Mark. This is, um, I, I'm trying to address your, your notion of toxic mas masculinity. I had the privilege of meeting a man called Sean Harvey in New York, and he was one of, I think there was 17% of the total workforce of Eileen Fisher, which was a, an upmarket um, woman clothing line in America. And he noticed how well the 17% of men worked in a corporate culture in which, um, which was run on feminine principles. And I, I was just going to offer Sean Harvey as a resource because he's also in his own desire to start a, a, mas a, a sort of masculine movement. 
he, he, he's been emphasizing compassionate ma masculine uh, trait. Um, and from a psychological point, to, to own the toxic elements of masculinity, but also to transform the toxic elements into a more, tox into a more compassionate masculinity. So I just wanted to offer Sean Harvey as a resource. Um, he's not an academic, but he's, um, he's a wonderful practitioner and can be found on LinkedIn. Final comment, question? So we've had three, we can <coughs> take four. And? Thank you, Mark. That was really interesting. I was just this week watching a documentary about um, Europe, European um, talking about how they see the problem with energy around the world. And one of the things was obviously the supply constraint um, producing enough. But um, I think the other thing that made me realize is when he said, by you going to a video shop, uh, driving there and back to get the video out, and then driving there and back to take it back again, you use li much less energy than us watching the movie on Netflix because we download it with a service with the heat that it takes all the energy it takes for the service. So, I mean, our social practices, he was saying, is something that we need to look at our consumptive practices, um, as well as the manner in which we supply these. And I was, I was just wondering how that social aspect would fit into what you were talking about today. Maybe if you could elaborate on that. Okay, thanks. Um so, so to me, is your question the same as question at the back, like the workers? Well, but more perhaps under the historical moment of our transition, oh, starting from 2009, yeah. I believe, but obviously there were some talks behind, behind yeah. the talks from 2008, partly coming from their side, and yeah. the Eskimos not really interested in yeah. yeah, so, um, I mean, although it's not uh, a specific focus, uh, it's, it's implicit in, in what I'm wrestling with in, in, in the book, especially uh, when it comes to thinking about alternatives to capitalism as we know it. So the form of capitalism that we are heading into now, kind of actually head are into, is a form of capitalism, in my view, that has no longer a need for democracy. Um, and if you contrast that to, say, the mid-decades of the last century, where the nation-state, in, in its fairly, fairly democratic form in certain parts of the world, not all, uh, with an enlarged internal market uh, made possible by relatively high wages and high levels of employment and high taxation, uh, those economic policies uh, were critical and counter-cyclical, Keynesian counter-cyclical counter financing was a critical in creating the stability for reconciling capitalism and democracy. The struggle for democracy now, uh, especially from the perspective of workers, and in particular unemployed workers, uh, may, it, it may be realizable in a rejuvenated, more humane capitalism, but I have my doubts. Uh, and that is, but I'm, I have always resisted the view that critique is sufficient for understanding the alternative. You have to do the hard work and think the alternative uh, if, you, if workers are to have an agenda. Um, uh, and so that's why I'm attracted to this, to this new literature on the commons. So what the new literature on the commons is, is, is talking about is a new form of work uh, that is appropriate for an environment where we are being disciplined by an absolute bullshit ideology of fourth industrial revolution. We're being intellectually disciplined in preparation to kind of accept the inevitability of the loss of work. Uh, um, and basically the, the the commons movements and the experiments and hubs and initiatives all around the world, which I'm starting to study, uh, are, are, co are, com are actually, they're actually quite, quite similar in many ways, actually, to the, to the 
late 18th century, 19th, you think of Spain and what became Mondragon, the kind of the cooperative movement came out of industrial workers. Um, uh, so there's a very similar dynamic now, but with uh, knowledge workers, coders, uh, media workers, uh, the, all, all those kinds of people who are, who are cyborgs, who are inseparable from the gadgets and the machinery, etc. And out of that is emerging a, 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 a zero marginal cost type economies, which I think are worth looking at from a progressive perspective point of view, especially if you, if you assume that the traditional form of work as, an as a worker and, 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 and employer, that conception of work, if that fades, what's the alternative conception of work if you reject fourth industrial revolution kind of disciplinary thinking? And I think, you, I, I can't think of another orientation than Productive, the, the intellectual and, 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 and social productivity of this new literature and new acti activism around the construction of, of new forms of commons. And basically, in essence, what commons looks like is where there's voluntary labor that builds the shared knowledge, and, uh, which is permissionless uh, and, and non-local, uh, or doesn't have to be local, um, but local, but, but to, but the, the productive use of that shared, uh, collectively generated knowledge is licensed uh, through uh, local entrepreneurship and local ownership. So I just think something like that we need to really think about. <coughs> um, the, 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 the South African moment, uh, is just in very, very crude terms, in my view, um, uh, is the moment of reckoning has arrived. Uh, in post-1994, we accepted a fundamental tenet of the apartheid era, which is the indispensability of the mineral energy complex. The mineral energy complex was built to construct to, to, as the economic engine of racial capitalism. We thought we could deracialize it, because we assumed uh, that cheap coal is a necessary precondition for building an export-oriented economy. Uh, it went, we, we paid lip service to uh, uh, a decent wage, but that was confined to the unionized uh, workforce. And the, re the, the masses who didn't get employed got social grants. Uh, so we actually constructed a, a, a dual labor market of an unemployed reserve army and, a, and an aristocracy. Uh, premised on uh, the mineral energy complex, and we deepened our dependence on that complex as we deindustrialized. <coughs> Coal hasn't remained cheap, bottom line. Um, so that assumption is gone. Renewable energies, in the meantime, have dropped 90%. Uh, and if we made, if we, if we accelerated the transition to renewables now, uh, we, would, we would create a whole new set of value chains, a uh, whole new industrialization opportunities, uh, massively reduce the energy costs of, of the national economy, and we would uh, deal with our, one of our biggest challenges that have not been articulated in the ESCOM crisis, which is the cost of stranded assets. The stranded assets are the coal we won't be able to sell and the infrastructures we are building. The people who have done the work on Kosile prove, without a shadow of a doubt, it's cheaper to close Kosile now than keep on building it and running it. The value of stranded assets is 120 billion rand over the next, uh, by 2030. That's been calculated by a joint venture between the World Bank, the French Development Bank, and the Development Bank of Southern Africa, and the Climate Policy Initiative. Very, very thoroughgoing paper. This hasn't been factored into the conversation. So our moment of reckoning is now. We think we can uh, somehow in this new dawn build a, rebuild a, a consensus, a new social compact, uh, without fundamentally changing our understanding of the economy. 
But what comes out of Gwede Mantasha's mouth is just 20th century. It's just so 20th century. It's so out of date. He's positioning us to be a laggard. And, and if the decisions on ESCOM are not made within the next couple of weeks, and there were meetings the last few days that are uh, hopeful, but if the key decisions are not made in the next couple of weeks, that's Pravim Gordon's commitment. Um, uh, we're heading into a bailout, an IMF bailout. And an IMF bailout, South Africans don't understand. It means somebody takes control of your treasury and says, cut, the, cut, the, cut your expenditure, um, increase taxes, uh, and all the good things that we expect uh, in, this, in, in South Africa just are not going to happen. And that will exacerbate conflict uh, because as South Africans, we won't just accept it. Uh, we will toy toe and we'll protest and we'll march and we'll organize and that's going to uh, and force the state to do stuff it can't do because somebody else is running the treasury. And that will trigger an authoritarian response. <laughs> and the good news? Uh, so just, uh, yeah. just, uh, just, uh, just on this, uh, on this energy supply issue, um, um, the alternative masculinity. There's a there's a lot written alternative, and there are NGOs and movements. So yeah, but the the, the on on decarbonisation, the absolute bottom line is that. You can't replace oil and coal with uh, renewables. Because the energy return on energy invested in renewables is very low. So you have to, have to radically de-energize, not just decarbonize, de-energize. Um, you have to massively reduce the total amount of energy used and decarbonize it, if you, re if, if you want to do this transition. And the de-energization part hasn't received a lot of attention. It, it's articulated in, um, in a kind of industrial ecology language translated into energy efficiency. But energy efficiency simply says doing more with less, uh, simply means doing more of the same with less, uh, rather than not doing a whole bunch of stuff uh, with a whole lot less. And that's a different conception of energy efficiency or de-energization that has to go. So all the economic models that have been done on the energy transition, forget about climate, just energy, uh, you have to de-energize and decarbonize. Okay, we, we have time for one, one round. Um, we, it will be interesting to see what um, Devon Pillay and others make of it. I mean, in terms of putting forward an idea of eco-socialism. Um, and also, Sid Luckett will be a discussant next week. And he's quite taken, you may, I mean, you've seen a bigger picture. He's quite taken by this eco-movement in uh, northern Syria, the Oshalan. You, you know the story. I, I know very little about it. Where people have actually, well, it's based on a prisoner, Oshalan, who's been in a, he was with the, the Kurdish Communist Party for a very long time, and he's been writing prolifically about what we could label eco-socialism and so on. So is this, my question would be, is this a time for big ideas in small places that can help shift the way we think? Um, incrementalism, how does it, how does it work in, in a context where the problem seems so overwhelming that when I teach anything on the Anthropocene or the capitalist scene. I notice my students kind of Sink. often lose their energy and yeah. it's like, oh shit, this is what you're doing. Yeah. And I almost feel I shouldn't be teaching. So I should give a warning before I teach it. Yeah. A trigger warning. So how, <coughs> how do we think it through? Uh, Haraway and yeah. Anna Tsing will say, well, let's not go with hopeless techno fix idealism mm. or despair. Yeah. And yeah. So it's, it's that interesting mix of, of dealing with facing it and also not yeah. dis despairing in the face of the scale of it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you love despair, this is a great moment for you. <laughs> 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 but uh, there, 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 there's a real problem with critique 
that leaves no space for imagining alternatives. And I have always struggled against that. During the struggle years when it was, you know, capitalist apartheid, races, la da 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 okay, fine, 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 but what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. How do we think about that? So I've, I've always, always been obsessed with this thinking about, and, and that's why I've always been driven into local struggles, local alternatives, local, and then I, in the last 20 years, Landock Eco Village, figuring out that in a little postage stamp. But the, the, why I think that's so, I loved your phrase, big ideas in, in, in small spaces. Is that what you said? Yeah, it's probably not yeah. mine. Yeah. I think it's very similar <laughs> to <laughs> 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 a similar title. <laughs> And, and, and uh, the common response to, so, uh, so just let me maybe tell the story this way. So when people come to, say, Lion Dog, visit Lion Dog Eco Village, they say, oh, this is so amazing, but you know, it's completely irrelevant because it's just in one place. Uh, what, what that response doesn't recognize is that in the, in the practice of constructing alternatives, you change. You become a different person. And that's not what is, recognized when you're kind of at arm's length, examining you know, how many smalls do we need in order for some quantum shift to take place at a global level and have all these fancy conferences and expensive hotels to have those kinds of discussions. It's the doing that is transformative. And that's where the, that's where the, where the hope lies. And there's, and there's lots of historical precedent. I mean, look, I mean, Polanyi. I mean, what was Polanyi saying? You know, the double movement was, yes, there was this rapacious, greedy, extractive, uh, financialized capitalism of the late 1800s into the early 90s, which triggered these terrible mass uh, murders, of what we call First and Second World War. Uh, but there was an alternative set of associationalism. Small, tens of thousands of small incrementalist knittings together that created the alternative and the basis for social welfare states after the Second World War. So I think we're in exactly the same kind of double movement. All over the place, wherever I go in the world, wherever I go, and I travel a shitload, I walk into places, and it's like I've been here before. Because you recognize the DNA. They all look the same. All these initiatives have got very similar dynamics, similar characters, characters leading them, similar networks, similar languages. How does this happen? There's no one text. There's no one great leader. It's, it's amazing to me, and that's where my hope lies. Yeah. I know John's hand was up. Yeah, but I think Mark has yeah. actually answered the question because looking for the evolution potential of the present where we are now, we only see that backlash of fascism. We're exactly. not going to see it. And I wanted to drop Polanyi into the. Is there a counter movement to that? that we yeah, can, there is, of course. There I is. know, but I mean, yeah. it needs to be. Yeah, I mean one reviewer of the book, um, in fact it was Marina Fischkowski, she um, she she had a she she had a phraseology which Initially, I read as complimentary, and then I had second thoughts. <laughs> it said, this is a book about hope in a world where the evidence for it doesn't exist. Great. Final, we have one final, final. Okay. We, have we got, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes. So they'll have to be quite quick, because we've got three, four minutes. Talking. <laughs> Good point. Mark, I want to but make sure you bring something <laughs> around that DNA, that thread that you see happening uh, in these alternative spaces. If you've written something of your observation, and this one of the chapters does that. Chapter five. Um, um, no, it's, sorry, it's chapter six. But the the I I I, I, I try and write up in it, in short kind of half page. Uh, story modes, uh, places that I've visited, and, and others that I know people who from or I've read about, where I try and and I don't do a good job at all. It's not. It doesn't really capture the energy that I'm looking for. Uh, but I've, 
that's what I'm really, really interested in. And I think the mistake that I made in the, in the chapter was more of a kind of sociological perspective on the, the kind of uh, similar dynamics that you find across these different. What I've become more and more interested in is the leadership types, the kinds of activists, the kinds of uh, individuals, uh, which is overwhelmingly women, uh, who, 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 who play at this kind of relational, mobilizing, uh, reconstituting kind of role that creates spaces, uh, sometimes just for protection of, 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 a, of, of a people or a, or a resource or both. Uh, and other times it's like very transformative movements in, 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 in financial spaces, for example. So I'm very, very interested in this dynamic and what happens in moments of crisis and profound despair that makes it possible for people to co network to coalesce around certain kinds of people. I would love to know more about that. I mean, you're an anthropologist. You should do that. <laughs> we'll tell you later. Um, you had a point. Um, just very quickly, um, I've noticed pieces, bits and pieces of references that pointed me in this direction. I just wondered if you ever encountered the work of um, Nick Cernick and Alex Williams. Cernick. Um, yeah, it's, it's our in I C K I think. Um, but they, they are part of the accelerationist tradition um, or school of thought. Um, I just wondered if you... What, which, what, which accelerating what? The great accelerations of this no. 50s and 60s? No, no yeah, um, it's, it's more um, post Deleuzean. Okay. Yeah, it's... Okay. John, just does it ring a bell? <laughs> no. If John doesn't know it, then, I'm, I, then I don't feel too bad. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Thank, thank you very much, Marcus.